um, pass the microphone to Helen Gorbos, who is the National Tactical Advisor for Modern Slavery. Um, just to correct Corinne slightly, I'm one of four national tactical advisors. My colleagues would never forgive me. Um, I have been introduced as the national tactical advisor before by accident. It was actually in a television appearance and it did not go down very well at all. So we'll just set the record straight around that. So um, yeah, that's me. My name is Helen Gordos and I am a national tactical advisor for modern slavery and human trafficking. Um, I've been doing that role for four and a half years now. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about what my department does a bit later on. But without further ado, I want to get into what modern slavery is about. And let me set the point for you first. It is simply the exploitation of someone's vulnerability. It's about people being targeted because they are vulnerable in some way and exploited by criminals for a benefit. And that's simply what it is. And we'll probably get into some different exploitation types throughout the presentation. And then it can, be, it can get quite complicated. But I just want you to remember, it's just about exploitation of vulnerable individuals. Okay, so I ask myself this question every day, even though I've been a law enforcement officer for 23 years and I've been doing this role for four and a half years. How is this happening in 2018, in the 21st century, when slavery, slavery was abolished over 150 years ago now? And I want to talk about the two images on this slide to start with. Bit of an analogy for you, bear with me on this. So the image on the left is of my dog, Fred. Okay. Now I rescued Fred um, 12 and a half years ago now when he was six months old. Um, he'd been poorly treated. But Fred's a dog, I know that. Um, but bear with me on this. He'd been poorly treated, he'd been, been frustrated at a young age, he had his tail docked. But Fred was lucky because I came along and saw him in the kennels actually at Shrewsbury Police Station, fell in love with him and took him home. So you can see him there dozing on his memory foam bed, surrounded by his toys, he gets treats, he gets cuddles on the sofa, um, and sometimes on the bed, normally when my other half isn't around. Um, so that's Fred the dog. Now, let's get serious. The image on the right is a shed. And about five weeks ago, I knocked on that shed door and was introduced to a victim of modern slavery, a 58-year-old male who had been targeted at the age of 18, and he'd got some learning difficulties. Family had broken down, and he was targeted by travellers. And he was taken to a traveller site, and he has lived in that shed for 40 years. Now, all he'd got inside that shed was, hopefully you can see on the image, there's, there's some soiled bedding, a chair, a dangerously widened television because the shed leaked. And he'd only got the clothes he was standing up in. The worrying thing is that law enforcement had been onto that traveller site on a couple of occasions. And we've got to try and learn the lessons around this. And that uh, victims of human trafficking or modern slavery will not talk to us in the place that they're being exploited with the exploited present. It's not enough to, go, to ask somebody in that environment whether they're okay, whether they need help. They're not going to tell us. So what we did, we took him away. We bought him some new clothes. We fed him. And we started to reintroduce his human rights that had been horrendously stripped from him for 40 years. <coughs> and what he told us was that for 10 hours a day, he'd been made to work for 20 pounds. He'd got no access to, to bathing or, or showering facilities. He had to use a leisure centre. Um, horrendous uh, violation of his human rights. But you'll be pleased to know that he is now in Salvation Army accommodation, he's doing well, but there's a long way to go because he's had 40 years of this. And again, I ask you, how can a dog be treated so well, yet one human being can treat another in that way? I don't know the answer to that question, but what I do know is that we can all make a difference. Unfortunately, some more horrible images. Um, the top two images are from an investigation that was run by Lincolnshire Police. Again, 
a traveller site, and you can see there the um, exploiters' accommodation and the luxury that they're living in compared to the accommodation they put their victims in. And again, they've been exploited through labour. The exploiters will exploit anybody in, in, in any way possible. So in that Lincolnshire case, they were also claiming benefits in their name. Not only were they putting them out to work in their tarmac in roofing businesses, but they were claiming benefits in the victims' names as well. And this is the sort of thing they will do. And they were paid for luxury holidays um, for themselves. Um, they even used one of the victims' benefits to pay for one of their children to be coached at Man United Football Club. So when you're thinking exploitation, think about the other potential ways that they are being exploited as well. Taking mobile phones out in their names, taking bank accounts out, and taking control of the bank accounts and running overdrafts up. Anything you can think of, they will look to exploit them. So the image at the bottom right, um, that was um, from a, uh, a young Chinese female, again, some learning difficulties. She was brought over um, by her husband um, and um, lived initially in his Chinese restaurant. And he soon got bored of her and he got a girlfriend. And the girlfriend wasn't very happy that he'd got a wife. And again, she had some learning difficulties, so she, she couldn't deal with, with the situation. She couldn't seek help. But she was forced to live in an outhouse, and that was her bed. And the interesting thing about this case was that there was a serious case review afterwards because she also worked in the restaurant, front facing, so you know she was serving customers. Environmental health went in, and in a subsequent police investigation, everybody talks about the fact that they'd observed injuries, but nobody, nobody made any sort of referral to anybody, to the police, the safeguarding referral, and unfortunately, that young Chinese victim ended up being murdered. And both her husband and the girlfriend went to prison for that, but that was preventable. It was preventable. Image on the bottom left, uh, property in London, houses of multi-occupancy are a massive indicator that you may have an exploitative situation, a modern slavery situation. Many Eastern Europeans um, are brought over and put into multi-occupancy properties. And the living conditions are horrendous. No hot water. Um, I've been into properties where we've had 20 housed in wooden constructions in the back garden, each being charged £300 for their, for their rent. So my maths isn't brilliant, but I think that's about £6,000 a month. And that's before they even start with the labour exploitation. So this is, this is the sort of thing that you know, we're seeing on a regular basis um, and we need people to look out for and report. Okay, so unfortunately it, it is a bit of a, a, a depressing subject matter, um, but let's move on a little bit in terms of what we do and hopefully how we can help you in your business areas. So as I said before, there's four tactical advisors um, and we cover the whole of the UK. And we provide a 24-7 on call service, and that is not just to law enforcement agencies, but that is to all partners. <coughs> so if you're stuck with a modern slavery situation, a human trafficking situation, maybe you think somebody needs referring to the national referral mechanism, which I'll talk about later, that's our victim identification and support process we have in place in the UK, then you can ring up and you can ask for um, help and advice. One of us is on call 24-7. So what, what do we do? We'll give you advice in terms of what you've got in front of you. We'll give you advice um, around um, <coughs> how best to investigate if you're a police officer, to link you into other investigations, to assist in terms of the safeguarding. You may have inquiries in other countries that you need to do. Well, we have um, NCA officers embedded in over 100 different countries. So please don't think because we're, we're dealing obviously with foreign nationals all the time now, that it isn't possible to do inquiries in other countries. We can, and in some countries we can do that relatively easily. So if you're stuck around that, then please give us a ring. And you're going to hear from um, CTAC later on, they're doing a workshop, and they're fantastic in terms of assisting around foreign national inquiries. So in a nutshell, that is what we do. So I'm going to move on now to talk about 
um, a hugely reported topic at the minute, county lines. And, and what county lines is, is um, simply children, vulnerable individuals being targeted to run drugs. That's what it is in its simplistic terms. But we're starting to understand now that we not only need to deal with these organised crime groups for um, drugs trafficking, but this is human trafficking as well. It fits into our legislation, and our legislation is really powerful. So the next, this, I'm just going to show you a video about a recent um, West Midlands police case you may have seen where they were successful in, uh, in prosecuting uh, an individual, not only for drugs trafficking, but for human trafficking as well. There is some sound shortly. You can see that he's buying children's tickets. Good evidence, you know, in terms of the investigation. He's buying children's tickets. He knows they are children that he's using to run these drugs for him. He distances himself from those uh, children, and that's why they use um, children. Um, because if they do get prosecuted, the sentences um, are dispensable. Okay, so interestingly, um, he actually got eight years for the human trafficking offence. So he got more for the human trafficking offence than he did um, for the drugs trafficking. Um, but we're starting to change our mindset now and understand that we don't want to criminalise uh, these children and vulnerable adults that are used. Actually, we need to be targeting the crime groups that are using them in that sort of activity. There's a workshop later on, obviously, around county lines, where we'll discuss that case study a little bit further. <coughs> um, threat assessment for county lines, that is published online as well. Um, go onto the NCO website. But again, an intelligence requirement was sent out to all forces, and apparently it is unheard of for all forces to respond to intelligence requirements. They're sent out around different threat areas. But all the forces wanted to tell us about the issues they're having with county lines and, and, and interestingly they all report, or many of them report, issues with children being used, issues with vulnerable adults being used, um, the use of knives and weapons etc. We get the gist. Okay, so on the theme of criminal exploitation still, and we'll look at some other, um, another type of criminal exploitation. Um, but Agencies have got to investigate. Um, you know, we have a duty to investigate, and you know, some agencies are being sued now for failing to investigate. And you know, they're sued because their um, a victim's human rights have been have been breached. They've got the right not to be held in slavery or servitude, um, right not to be subjected to torture, to cruel or inhuman treatment. We've got to investigate this, and I think you know, the police won't mind me saying this. It's not just down to the police, it's a multi agency response, actually, it's everybody's responsibility. But we've, we've made some mistakes around this, um, in that we've been really tunnel visioned and you know, put someone in front of us for a crime, and you know, we've just been concentrated on um, you know, investigating that crime and not thought, well, where's this person come from? What's their background? Have they been forced into this? <coughs> and there is a defence in law which we will touch on. But I just want to show you um, another video now around Vietnamese trafficking. Um, and this is the sort of explanation you will get if we sit down and talk to people and find the time and I know we're busy to actually connect with the person in front of us. You will get their life story as we can build. They will tell you everything. They will tell you everything. They will tell you their journey. And believe you me, 
if we take the time to do that, a lot of these stories are, are, are um, horrific. Làm nhiều 
lạnh từ đó rồi mình đã nhập cánh khi đó thì quá khổ thì chết còn hơn thì cái cái Bonds, nail bars is where we find them predominantly. Is massive. It's you know it's across Shropshire. It's across um, the whole of the UK. It, it's a massive problem, a massive issue. One of the biggest um, holds in terms of Vietnamese, um, and the reason they will keep going missing and keep going back to their exploiters is because it's debt bondage. You know they're desperate to earn money to, to pay the debt off, which to them is a very real debt. And they've charged, you know, 30, 40,000 euros in some cases, and they'll think that, you know, they've got to pay that debt off. It's not achievable, um, but to try and break that in terms of, you know, their understanding this isn't a real debt, and to try and offer them help is, is very difficult. But, you know, what we have done it in a number of cases, so, you know, I know it's frustrating um, because we all know dealing with Vietnamese people, the likelihood is they will go missing, but we have had a number of cases where we have managed to rescue them and offer them support. Um, a few indicators, I'm conscious of the time, I've got a lot to get through. Um, there are many indicators, you'll find them all online, okay, but you know, I've just listed a few of them there, there's some obvious, obvious ones that are probably already touched on in terms of, you know, housing situations. Is somebody talking for, for another person, separate them, take them away, don't speak to somebody um, in the place where they may be being excluded. <coughs> take positive action. If you're the police and you can make an arrest because you've got reasonable grounds to suspect, do it. Um, and then get the victim out of that situation. What I will say is that um, the biggest indicator you will have is your gut feeling um, that something isn't right. And what I would urge you to do is follow that and take some sort of positive action. Okay, so we're going to um, just have a look at a very brief look at the figures. Again, they're all online, so you know I'm not going to go into too much detail around them. Um, the National Referral Mechanism, it's been in since 2009. It's what we do use for our strategic reports, but it's a bit flawed, really, because adults have to consent to go into that process. As you can see, um, year on year, there's been an increase. Um, so from 2013, when we started recording data, um, we had 17, um, 1,745 referrals. Last year, over 5,000 referrals. Um, there's thousands more victims than that. Um, and you know the, that estimate at the bottom from the government is probably a far more accurate estimate, and there's probably thousands more than that. If I'm truly honest. Okay. Again, what I'm going to point out on that slide is that the top referred country last year were UK nationals. This isn't about foreign people. This is not about foreign victims. Our own are being exploited. Many of those referrals. Um, are from CSE cases, county lines cases, um, labour exploitation that I've talked about, traveller sites, um, you know, adult men down on their look, being targeted at soup kitchens, homeless shelters, uh, and offered a new lease of life and then taken and horrendously abused and exploited through labour. So don't think this is just about a foreign thing, it's not. Again, further breakdown of the exploitation types are there. You see labour exploitation um, is top, followed by sexual exploitation, domestic servitude. We haven't got time to touch on everything, but that is so hidden. How do we get behind closed doors to see whether someone um, you know, is being treated as a slave in a property? Okay, so just another, a quick case study now. I, I wanted to use this just to demonstrate um, the power of our modern slavery act 2015. I'm really proud of it actually. Uh, we have something within that called extraterritorial jurisdiction. So a British national, irrespective of where they commit an offence under Section 2 of the Modern Slavery Act, and wherever they commit it in the world, we can prosecute them here. It doesn't matter that the victims never set foot in this country. And that's what we did um, with this individual, Josephine Alamu, who was known as Madam Sandra by her victims. 
So she was originally from Liberia. She was a registered nurse, would you believe? Um, and she became a British citizen in 2009. So she comes into play for our Modern Slavery Act. Um, an image there of when she was subsequently arrested um, in terms of what she did. And let's talk about those real properties in Nigeria. She had a number of properties. But let's talk about what she did. So with the help of another member of the crime group, she targeted vulnerable um, females in a place called Benin City in Nigeria. Horrendously poverty ridden place. Well, I've actually been there and it is awful. And they offered these girls um, money um, and hope. Um, and they knew they were going to be working as sex workers. They didn't know where they were going to where they were going to end up somewhere in Europe, but they knew they were going to be working as, as, as sex workers. Um, she subjected them to juju ceremonies, which I'll talk about on the next couple of slides. She told them the cost of their travel would be 37,000 euros, and they've got no idea of the value of a euro, and that actually to pay that debt off would have taken years and years, you know, before they started earning money, which they could send back at home for their families and their children that they had to leave behind. So they travelled the horrendous, um, dangerous journey that was described by um, Bill, similar journey. Um, and that's some of the accounts that the victims gave of their journey. It, it's absolutely awful. Um, they travel to Agadez and then they have to travel over um, the desert to get to Libya. And that if you survive the journey across the desert, that you're lucky. Traffickers, um, competing traffickers will shoot at trucks um, so people will get killed. Um, they'll push you off the trucks. So that in itself is a horrendous journey. And then once in Libya, they get put in a connection house where they get raped and assaulted and abused. And one of the victims in this case fell pregnant. And they were then put on an inflatable boat and they were rescued. And just so you're aware as well that actually the rescue missions in the Mediterranean are phenomenal. And we've actually got our border force officers working on a cruiser out there rescuing these migrants, doing absolutely an amazing job. Okay, so Juju, what is Juju? Um, some of you may not have heard of Juju. We have had a number of cases uh, in the UK where Juju has been used. Um, Victoria Columbia, I think we've all heard that name. Um, Juju was involved in that, in the death of Victoria Columbia. They thought she was a witch. So that might put it into a little bit of perspective how it's used. Um, so a Juju priest is highly respected across West Africa. And it's something that people really, truly believe in. So we need to take it seriously. If someone says, you know, I've, I've, I've been subjected to a juju ceremony, we have to take it seriously. So what the trafficker did was she sent the victims to a juju priest where they had to take part in certain rituals. And some of those rituals involved them um, drinking blood with worms in it, um, having to eat the heart of the chicken, um, and also, um, having their skin cut with razor blades and black powder whipped into it. And then they're told, you must obey Madam Sandra, you must repay this debt, because if you don't, these awful things are going to happen to you. Um, things like the juju will impregnate you, and water will run from your vagina, and men will run away from you. And it might sound far-fetched and crazy, but they really believe these awful things are going to happen to them. They really, truly do. So that's the hold, that's the hold that she's exerted over them to get them to do what they want. So they, um, they were subsequently trafficked to, to Germany and one of their victims was rescued uh, and that had a knock-on effect as four other victims were rescued. The Germans approached the National Crime, AG, National Crime Agency and we agreed that we would prosecute here because our legislation was far more powerful. So our human trafficking offence carries life imprisonment We've got the extraterritorial jurisdiction. So we prosecuted her. And recently, in July, she received 18 years imprisonment. I will also mention that those victims were phenomenal. They gave evidence from a live link in Germany. What we were also able to do, and this is talking about international reach now, we have a joint border task force in Nigeria. Um, the Juju priest, we managed to trace, and we managed to film a reversal ceremony so we could show the girls that the juju had been reversed. So when I talk about international reach, that's the sort of thing that we can potentially do. So 
that's one of our NCA cases. I'm going to briefly touch on the national referral mechanism very quickly. Hopefully you're all aware of it. It's our victim identification and support process. Again, if you go online, all the information is there. All the referrals will come into our departments. Um, if they're an EEA nominal, they will be dealt with um, by our unit. If they're not in EEA, they'll go to UK visas and immigration. Okay. And practically, what the referral system does for adults is give them safe accommodation and support and a plan tailored to meet their needs. The children's social services take up the care mantle, but it's important that they're still referred in. And when you put a referral in, it will get sent to the police. The police will prime it and will investigate it. So it's really important we've got that multi-agency set up if you're going to put an NRM referral in. Discuss it between agencies. Okay, that's all I'm going to say on the NRM because I'm conscious of the time. But I... You've got these presentations in your pack. Um, I really want to finish on an upbeat note. So I'm sorry, but you've got to see my dog again, Fred. I want to assure you there can be happy endings, not just for dogs, for human beings as well. And we can all make a difference to that. So thanks for listening. I'm sorry about that.